Well, through my transition into singleness, there was a big shift in my friendships at the Kingdom Hall. No one quite knew what to do with me anymore. I felt horribly ungrounded. My usual married women friends avoided me after my divorce. I felt like I had been dumped into a new congregation. Seriously. It was so strange to observe the changes in my relationships with the other sisters in the hall. And I know I've heard people talk about this before. It happens in congregations, too. Fortunately for me, a new sister moved into the congregation who seemed to gravitate to me for some reason. She approached me after her very first attendance at a Sunday meeting. And she was very open with me, very friendly. Gabby was her name. Not her real name, just one I use for this video. She was newly divorced for the second time and understood what changes a person goes through after a divorce. Very fitting friend. <laughs> she was very sympathetic to my emotional state. And she liked me. So we started hanging out together. She'd come over to my apartment or I'd go over to her place. And we'd go out for lunch together or go shopping together. So yay, I made a new friend. And uh, she filled the gap where the other usual sisters abandoned me in my newly divorced state. Fickle bunch. There was safety and security in belonging to a religious community. I liked being with my new friend Gabby. I had a sense of belonging somewhere. I had a friend. She seemed to enjoy spending time with me and she understood and supported me when I had doubts about myself. We talked for hours about our respective divorces. I found myself back on track when I confided to her about how ungrounded I felt. I was in shock over my divorce and happy to have some company. Even though I chose the divorce, I didn't know how painful it would be to actually go through, go through the divorce. Clearly, Gabby and I were both healing. We talked to each other about how bad our marriages were before they blew up. Her husband had cheated on her, and he was a lot like Jerry, I concluded. He couldn't say no to the ladies either. Dallas was not bad looking. Not as great as Gabby thought, though, once she showed me some photos of him. I listened as she described how Dallas loved her to dress up in fancy outfits. And this worked well because Gabby loved, loved to dress up and feel glamorous. However, Gabby desired an enchanting life from a man who couldn't give it to her. But from fashion model to JW? Let's see. Gabby described how she used to be a fashion model in Montreal. She was a beautiful lady a few pounds overweight, but still very photogenic. She loved attention. She loved beautiful clothes, having been on the cutting edge of the fashion industry and having been the center of attention on the runway. I saw how modeling could work for her. I asked her how she went from modeling to turning JW. She told me she had a JW friend in Montreal. He would talk to her about Armageddon's imminent approach and how only Jehovah's Witnesses would survive. She was skeptical at first, and that sounds pretty far-fetched, doesn't it? She asked him, How do you know what you're saying is true? What if it doesn't happen like you say? He put the question back on her. Ah, but what if it does happen? Do you want to die? Well, that question was enough to frighten Gabby into studying with the Jehovah's Witnesses. 
At one point, she actually vomited up a snake. She thought it was a demon. So that really cemented her into the JW-isms. Interestingly, much later, after I moved to British Columbia, I asked a shamanic acquaintance about what vomiting up a snake meant in a metaphysical sense. She told me Gabby gave up her sovereignty, which makes sense. When you go into a cult, yeah, you do that. The snake was apparently one of her totems. After that time, Gabby was an obedient puppet of the Babylonish Watchtower's industrialized religion. Little side point. Back to Gabby's friendship. Gabby told me she had a few stretch marks from having a baby during her first marriage. And in her second marriage, Dallas was very critical of her body. She simply adored him and longed for him to adore her too. Unfortunately, his criticism left her feeling inadequate, which slowly poisoned the relationship. And that led to their divorce. With all the things Gabby and I had in common, we quickly became good friends. We talked about my ex, Jerry, and her exes, Phil and Dallas, for a time. Gradually, as we both traveled down the healing path, the subject of discussion gravitated toward the kind of man each of us desired to meet, qualities and characteristics of our next witness husbands. I realized how much I wanted a man in my life who would dance. I wanted to be wooed and whined and dined and danced. This is a few months before I started dating Vince. Gabby decided she wanted a date. She answered a personal ad and agreed to meet a man at a lounge downtown. She described to him what she looked like and what she would be wearing and went to the lounge early. She brought a book along to read while she waited nervously for the arrival of her date. He stood her up. Unless, of course, it was the man at the next table also reading a book while seemingly amused by Gabby's nervous anticipation. Gabby made some small talk with the man and asked him if he too was waiting for someone. He laughed, squirmed in his chair, and said, Oh no. They struck up a conversation and he eventually walked her home and they exchanged phone numbers. This man was curious about Gabby even after she adamantly insisted. She was a Jehovah's Witness who had very strict standards about saving herself for marriage. A few days later, she invited him to her place for coffee. She lit candles and prepared her apartment in a very appealing, if not seductive, way with essential oils, soft music, dim lighting. As they got comfortable on the couch, she began to give him a foot massage. He became quite aroused by her inadvertent seduction and expressed his desire to make love. Of course, Gabby objected. We'd have to be married. Her new friend then leaped up, distressed, as if he had suddenly discovered her true agenda. He yelled at her for leading him on with strings attached, and he stomped out of her apartment. Gabby never saw him again. When Gabby told me her new friend thought the need for marriage meant strings were attached, it got me to thinking. He was right in a way. Holding out for marriage before having sex did give the impression of a feminine ploy. And by all worldly standards, her behavior on that date could have been perceived as a seduction scene. What do you think? What do you think? Feel free to comment down below. Enter Sister Myra. 
So then a woman named Myra moved into our congregation from across town. Lots of divorces going on across town. <laughs> she was newly divorced as well. She moved into Gabby's apartment complex and the three of us became friends. Myra was healing from divorce number three. She had been married to her current husband for about 15 years. She confided to us that she had experienced very little sexual activity throughout her recent marriage. Even on their wedding night, her new husband avoided having intercourse. Avoiding sex seemed inconceivable to me after what Gabby and I experienced in our marriages with our philandering husbands. All they wanted was sex from us or anyone. <laughs> The lack of sex in the marriage became unbearable for Myra. As she suffered along, she discovered that Phil was missing work some afternoons when she called his office. She began thinking he was having an affair and decided to hire a private detective to confirm or put to rest all of her fears. When the detective discovered what was drawing Phil away from the office, it came as a surprise to Myra he had a secret gambling addiction. A no-no in J.W.ville. At least back then, gambling was wrong. New light? Isn't there something about gambling in the elder's manual? That still didn't provide an answer to Myra's gnawing sexual desires. Poor Myra going without sex for weeks and months on end, that seemed like a cruel form of punishment. She was smart to bail out of such a frustrating marriage, even though the elders were very critical of her choice to do so. Their implication was that it was Myra's fault. The elders didn't understand and were quick to advise Myra to stay in the marriage and be more creative in bed. Myra had tried everything imaginable to interest her husband. Quite frankly, she had run out of options. This is the problem with elders. Their admonition seemed inappropriate and irrelevant. Sure, they were trying to help, except they weren't qualified marriage counselors. By setting themselves up as experts, they were removing healthier options for members with marriage problems. Like how about the possibility of troubled couples to seek help from real marriage counselors. Hmm. What a thought. <laughs> what a concept. Myra never found out why Phil was so sexually inept. Finally, after 15 years, she chose to end that marriage. Suffice to say, Myra vowed she would try out her next man before the wedding day to make sure they were sexually compatible. Even though such independent thinking was completely contrary to the teachings of their religion, it made absolute sense to me. I took note of this. It was in direct opposition to what the religion taught about marriage. But I wouldn't take that information to the elders, though. I kept Myra's confidence. Furthermore, I decided her situation was enough proof that the elders were acting inappropriately by counseling its members without proper training. I didn't want to go into any future marriage blindly either. I too silently wondered about trying out the man I might fall in love with to make sure we were compatible sexually. Nevertheless, back to Gabby, she was certain that she was going to wait until marriage to have sex. When I got involved in the dance world, obviously I didn't have as much time anymore to hang out with Gabby, but I was still going to meetings occasionally and that's when Gabby and Myra grilled me about my state of unusual happiness. My being suspiciously happy meant that some explanation was in order. They were worried I might get into trouble. Then one day, Gabby dropped by and announced,
This is Gabby. <laughs> I'm moving across town to a new congregation, Esther. I won't be seeing you at the meetings anymore. Oh, that's too bad. I looked at her with obvious concern. I would miss her companionship. Well, maybe we can still get together and meet for a movie sometimes. I'm going to miss you something awful. That'd be nice. Gabby's worried face lit up again as she grinned. I sensed she was afraid to tell me she was moving. She didn't want me to take her action of moving across town personally. She told me her rent had increased beyond what her budget could manage and she had to find a new place. She found a basement suite that was more affordable. It was smaller than her apartment, but quite suitable if she could thin out her possessions. And she wondered if I wanted her china cabinet. Maybe she wanted to even the score for when I gave her my portable dishwasher. When I moved into my apartment after divorcing Jerry, my suite had a built-in dishwasher, so I was happy for my much-loved portable Maytag to find a new home. I was enthusiastic to have her china cabinet. You bet, I said. You have a lovely china cabinet, and if you don't want it anymore, I'd be glad to give it a nice home. I know it would have a nice home here with you, she assured me, gazing around my impeccable apartment. My son, Sean, was agreeable to help me obtain the china cabinet. Since he had a hatchback car, he thought the top and bottom halves of the cabinet might fit into the back without too much difficulty. Sean. <laughs> this is Sean. <laughs> we could probably do it in one trip, Sean assured us. Sean arrived at the set time, and we went over to Gabby's to pick the china cabinet up. Unfortunately, Gabby was in a bad mood and started picking on Sean, regrettably, on an earlier occasion. I had confided in Gabby about Sean's disrespectful behavior toward me when I refused to make him a sandwich shortly after my divorce. I was tired of being the overfunctioner in the family. Gabby and Sean maneuvered the bottom half of the china cabinet through Gabby's apartment door through the stairwell door and navigated down the first few stairs when Sean tripped. Gabby snapped at him. Be careful! I know you don't care about my things, and you don't care about your mom, but have some respect. Shut up, Gabby! Sean yelled back. Sean was not in the mood to listen to Gabby's rant. He had heard enough earlier about the relationship drama triangles as taught by Dr. Cat, which he did not agree with. He didn't want to hear any more about respect. Besides, he felt sorry for Gabby's son, a few years his junior, who was at the receiving end of Gabby's angry outbursts many a time. Gabby's son accompanied her to the Kingdom Hall whenever he was not on visitation with his dad from her first marriage. I hoped my cheerful demeanor would be contagious. Hey, you two, everything's okay. No harm done. You're both safe. The china cabinet is safe. I was trying to keep them on the topic at hand, namely getting the china cabinet safely into my apartment. Personally, I wondered how deeply Sean's anger went. It seemed to me Sean and Gabby were pushing each other's hot buttons. And their behavior was scaring me. Sean regained his composure and his balance, and the rest of the move went smoothly without any more outbursts from either of them. Do you want a ride home, Gabby? Or are you staying to visit Mom for a while? 
Sean asked in a perfunctory way as he jingled his keys in his pocket, preparing to leave. I'll stay with your mom. We have some catching up to do, Gabby smiled impishly. Sorry about my outburst earlier. Aw, oh, it's okay, Sean reassured her. No big deal. Thanks for your help, Sean. I really appreciate it. I hugged him as he made his way out the door. Gabby was not okay about Sean, though. That boy is a lot like my boy, she warned me as soon as I had closed the door after Sean. She shook her head, disrespectful as can be. I shook my head along with her. I don't know what to do. I'm afraid of what he's going to do next. I tried to talk to him about his temper and his anger, but I think the issue goes deeper than what I am capable of helping him with. I taught too many subjection beliefs for him to suddenly start listening to women, even if I am his mom. And he didn't want therapy either, because he saw what it, you know, when, even when we were married, when I was still married, being on drugs and stuff, that, that was nice. Why don't you ask him to move out? Before he hurts you. You think? You think he could hurt me? I was bewildered. Well, first he punches the wall. Then he punches your closet door off its hinges. Maybe next it will be you. He's not a little boy anymore. He must be over six feet tall by now. That, plus a bad temper, need I say more? My eyes widened. I recalled the time in Lethbridge when he made Monique cry, and she accused him of being a bully. Oh, shivered. I can't think about that now. Tell me what's new with you while I wipe down this beautiful cabinet. So, Gabby moved to the other side of town. I'm thinking back, wondering if she moved out of her apartment complex because there were too many JWs close by. After all, she wanted to be meeting and dating men, worldly men. A basement suite would be more conducive to privacy. Fewer prying eyes. Less so than an apartment block full of JWIs peering out their windows and seeing her dating worldly men. On the other side of town, Gabby began to hang out at a local pool hall. And that is where she met Tom. They played pool together late into the night, and Gabby let him walk her home. Tom came by her new basement suite the very next day and waited at her door until she arrived home. She did not have the heart to say, Go away. I'm busy. Instead, she fed him and let him stay over, making him sleep on the couch. They cuddled and nicked, and finally, after only a week or so, Gabby brought up the subject of marriage. Tom said he'd think about it. Gabby became hopeful that she would marry again. 
From then on, when I called or came over to Gabby's, Tom was around and I was uncomfortable. Before ever meeting him, my impression based on the stories Gabby shared of Tom was that he drifted from place to place, staying wherever a woman took pity on him or fed him, like a stray cat. I didn't like this man right from the start. One time, while Tom walked Gabby home, he saw a guy on the street wearing a leather jacket that he liked. Tom assaulted the man, literally ripped the jacket off his back and claimed it as his own, while Gabby protested. Tom laughed for Gabby's objections, lame objections. Another time, Tom rummaged through Gabby's blue jeans in search of her bus pass. He planned to sell it for street value so he could hang out at the pool hall for the evening. She burst out crying. She learned quickly that if she cried, he took pity on her. On that occasion, he stopped short of stealing her bus pass. I tried to reason with her about what life would be like married to a man she couldn't trust. After all, weren't we both desirous of meeting brothers? You better hold out for a brother or you'll be sorry. Haven't you and I learned anything from choosing a worldly kind of man up till now? She was incensed and lashed out at me. You're prejudiced against native Indians. You're still mad at Jerry because he is living with one after leaving you. It's true. There are a lot of First Nations people in Saskatoon. And it's true that my ex was having an affair with one. But prejudiced? I didn't think so because even when I was in high school I had a crush on an Aboriginal boy. It's probably good that he wasn't interested in me because he liked to get high, sniffing gasoline. That spooked me. Besides, I was glad to be divorced. I certainly wasn't looking back, wishing I could be with Jerry. That was history well forgotten. I replied to her accusation about me being prejudiced by saying, sure, and Jerry has to lock up his wallet and other valuables in the trunk of his car when he goes home to her each night. How's that for the good life? I was concerned for Gabby's safety and well-being just as much as my own. I tried in vain to persuade her that she deserved so much more than what Tom had to offer. But my pleading fell on deaf ears, and I tried to avoid the subject after that. I didn't want to lose Gabby's friendship. That was likely our first fight with each other ever. I really loved her as a sister. Interesting that our first fight was about a man she loved and I hated. A few weeks later, Gabby stopped by unexpectedly. Her new friend, Tom, got arrested and was committed to the psychiatric ward for petty felons. I hoped the arrest and incarceration would open Gabby's eyes to the sheer ugliness of her new relationship with Tom. No such luck. She visited Tom in jail. It was then they decided if the two of them were married, they could have conjugal visits. She confided to me. I kind of discovered that I like it when he's in jail. Because I always know where he is then. Jail provides structure for our relationship. You know, and until we can find it on our own. She was beaming. Try as I might to wrap my head around her reasoning. I couldn't. 
Jail enabled Gabby to keep tabs on her stray cat. On the street, when Tom had money, he was gone for several days at a time. But when he was broke, he showed up at Gabby's door and she never had the heart to turn him away.